Welcome to this super special episode of the WBC Central podcast. If you have been following me on Twitter for any amount of time for WBC or international baseball content, you know that this has been a goal of mine to talk to this person, to get in touch and just to just to pick his brain on what he thinks about international baseball and the WBC. So honestly, this is like a dream come true for me. I am here with John Morosi, base international baseball extraordinaire, everybody's favorite WBC uh, coverage account uh, person on Twitter. How's it going, John? Great, Sean. Uh, thanks for the invitation. Uh, the, the very, very kind introduction. Certainly didn't need to say that, but I, I appreciate it very much. Uh, and, and thanks for all you've done to help grow the game and grow the tournament because your, your coverage has been outstanding. I've, I've been learning from you the last several months as well. So uh, keep it going. It really it means the world that you're uh, doing so much to just shine a light on this great tournament. And uh, I think it's going to be the best we've ever seen. Thank you so much. Um, I mean, I completely agree, as as you've probably heard me say as well. I think that this is easily going to be the best WBC we've had so far. Um, I've been covering the WBC for the last year, calendar year, and anybody that follows the WBC in any capacity, they know your name. So I'm really excited to get into this, uh, this conversation. I know that you're humble, but I just wanted to give you that shout out because people are really excited to hear from you. Um, so yeah, I wanted to just start with kind of I guess your background, uh, I just love to hear how you got into what you do. I know that you went to Harvard, um, you played JV ba- junior varsity baseball there. Uh, I know that you grew up loving baseball and hockey, kind of do both. Um, what was your first love though? Was it baseball or was it hockey? Uh, it was baseball. So the, the first Tigers game I went to was in September of 1987 with my dad uh, in Michigan. I grew up in a small town in Michigan. And so we, we drove down. The Tigers were making their their pennant drive there in the fall of, of 87. Uh, Doyle Alexander was on the mound in this particular game. Of course, uh, you, you may recall the name of the prospect the Tigers traded to get him. Uh, that would be John Smoltz, who's in the Hall of Fame. So uh, t- to many Tigers fans, uh, 87 is a bit of a bittersweet year because, uh, yes, they won the American League East on the final day in this great race against the Blue Jays, but it cost them Smoltz. So that's, uh, that is the the pretty significant postscript on that game and that story. But so I, I grew up principally as, as a baseball fan uh, and played it uh, the longest, as you, as you documented, I, I did not play it very well, but I, I did play it the longest. I had a chance to, to wear the Harvard uniform on the JV team. I, I want to make, make clear about that as you did. Uh, it's, it's certainly a different level than, than the varsity, but it was a lot of fun to, to wear that uniform, represent the university. Um, still not quite sure how I got in to begin with, but very grateful that I did um, some amazing memories in those years. I was actually for one year, a, a JV baseball teammate of David Stearns, the longtime Brewers GM. So we were on the same JV team. So uh, it's kind of a funny note from back then, but um, love my experience there. And hockey was the first sport I covered because I, I would cover the Harvard hockey team in the winter and then play JV baseball in the spring. It was, it was a fun routine. I loved it. I uh, had a great time there for four years, very sports centric in terms of what I was doing on campus. I, I actually also worked at the Boston globe uh, just on the clerk desk. So one of those very first entry type jobs in journalism, um, my major was environmental science and public policy, which I always uh, tell people when they ask, do I have to major in journalism to be a journalist? The answer is no. Uh, At least in my experience, the answer is no. Um, And so as time went on, Sean, I I just got more and more interested in the in the global dynamic of the sport. I I covered the Tigers for three years from 06 to 09 at the Detroit Free Press. Even previous to that, I covered the Mariners for the Seattle PI. Um, And so I I really think looking back on that 05 team in Seattle, it wasn't a very competitive team, but they had Ichiro and they had Felix who made his debut that year. And actually Felix was such a big story that year in Seattle that I would rather than cover all the Mariner games, I would drive down to Tacoma and cover Felix's starts. And so um, that really opened some eyes to me about, Felix, of course, at that time was 19 from Venezuela. So a lot of our interaction was in Spanish. My Spanish back then was 
was not as good as it is now. And so I had to really learn and, and improve and get better. So I think that that, that portal to understanding um, Venezuelan baseball culture and speaking with Felix and then covering the Tigers for those years, they were heavily Venezuelan influenced, whether it was Maglio or Cabrera, Carlos Guillen, Anibal Sanchez later, Freddie Garcia for a brief time. So I think I was always very intrigued by and curious about the international dynamic of the teams that I covered. And so when the opportunity came for me to actually cover the WBC in person for the first time in 2013, I, of course, had watched the previous two editions. But in terms of being there in person, uh, the first time I had done it was 13. And then, of course, 17, I was there for all the U.S. games and our broadcast on MLB Network. So it's been a progressively more and more involved life for me with the international side of the game and and getting a chance to to cover the the, the Tampa Bay Rays going to Cuba I've, I've covered the, the premier 12 in Japan I've been to Mexico twice for baseball Puerto Rico twice for baseball so um it's just been something I've really sought out in my life to try to travel as much as I can and once you get the international baseball travel bug in you Sean it really it never leaves and so uh I, I spend a lot of my planning time and my bosses know this. Okay. When can I go internationally the next time? Like what, how can I find a way to, to, to put that passport to use? Because I just find that you, you make friends in a really powerful way when you travel abroad and, and there's no better prism through which to do that than the world baseball classic. Yeah. Thank you for sharing. Um, that is, I mean, I would love to hear what your kind of background is and how you got to this point. I like how you emphasized that, you don't necessarily need to have a journalism degree. It's kind of what situation I'm in. I went to school for sports management, um, which is adjacent, but I, I didn't do any like journalism school or anything. So it's cool to see that your journey eventually led to where you are here. Um, and I think that you and I have a very similar, maybe it might manifest itself in different ways at this point, because uh, still uh, don't have the funds to travel quite as much. But I think we have a very similar love for like cultures and peoples and um, getting to travel to meet those people around the world that enjoy baseball differently, that watch and um, and consume baseball differently in those cultures than they do here. So it's it's been really cool to see kind of you follow your way through through the WBC as it's evolved as well. So have you so I, I watched like a, a documentary that I believe was through MLB Network about the 2006 WBC that you were kind of uh, you kind of commentated on so you didn't cover the 2006 or 2009 one 2013 was your first time actually covering it right so in 09 I was still on the Tigers beat I was actually just preparing to leave the free press to go work for Fox Sports so that was actually my my final spring training in Lakeland uh, covering the Tigers so that was my my final time there uh, in that camp I remember that was uh, Justin Verlander was still on the team there in Cabrera so yes I watched I watched that tournament uh, from Lakeland uh, at night. I still remember where I was watching the the, the game between the Netherlands and the Dominican Republic when uh, Urendel de Castro was the hero in that incredible upset and Rich Waltz is called down goes the Dominican. Uh, just so those, those moments and, and those cultural touchstones, I think for the sport are so special. So, so yes. So Oh nine, I covered remotely or watched it remotely and basically said to myself, okay, the next time this tournament happens, I've got to be there. I love it. That's awesome. Yeah, I was a little bit too young in 2009, 06 and 09 to watch it or remember it. 2013, I think I remember maybe watching a game or two. I was middle school, like going, I was, I guess I was in high school um, playing baseball myself. So didn't really care too much about other than what was on the diamond at the time. Uh, and then 2017, I, I did get a chance to watch most of those games. So it's, like I said, it's been really fun to just see it evolve and continue to grow. Um, you've kind of already touched on this briefly, but what is it about the WBC, I guess about international baseball and the WBC in particular that attracts you so much? The passion and the purity of of the emotion, uh, both on the field and in the stands. There's just no other place that you find it in in baseball. Uh, in terms of that level of play, plus that level of enthusiasm, you can go to a lot of winter ball games, and and there's that same passion or a similar one per person, but it maybe doesn't have that same amount of superstar personas on the field. And that's what makes this special. And that's, I think, what heightens the atmosphere all the more, that it is your national team. And 
I think that for the U.S., it's been a process of of our country collectively learning what that means Mm -hmm. and learning how to invest in our team. These are our guys. We're so big, Sean, as a country that we, it's almost hard for us outside of an Olympic context uh, to think about our team. These these Mm -hmm. are our guys because we're so big. There are very few times in American sports history where we have really adopted our national team as, as something that's truly significant as a cultural moment in time. Mm -hmm. I would say that the dream team certainly fits that description in basketball. Uh, You think about the women's world cup teams that won it in, in 15 and 19 uh, just their personalities and the way they played. I think the men's world cup teams to an extent um, you think about Landon Donovan's goal in in 2010 moments like that stick Mm -hmm. out, but we don't have that many that that really, even since the dream team that that stand out as as being as being teams that that were on the front of every Wheaties box, so to speak, or or, yeah. or on the cover of every daily newspaper in in the country. I really think the seventeen World Baseball Classic team was special. It, it represented something that I think was a watershed moment where maybe we as Americans broadly started to see a bit more of this tournament through the eyes of the rest of the world, because it's interesting, Sean, for us to reflect. And and I think this is sort of where maybe I get a little, uh, you know, a little emotional and a little bit, I don't know if it's naive or just uh, uh, really sort of authentic about how I feel about this. Uh, You take sports in America with all its complexity all the money, everything else that's involved in it and realize still how special uh, our country is and how special our sports are Mm -hmm. that for the other 19 teams in this tournament, that, that for, for them to a large extent, just being able to play baseball in the United States is an extraordinary achievement Mm -hmm. in this tournament. Yes. But at any point, If you grew up in the Dominican Republic and you make it here to this country playing baseball, you have done something extraordinary. If you are building a baseball culture in the Czech Republic or in Great Britain or in Italy or in the Netherlands and you make it to pitch at Chase Field or or in Miami for the quarterfinals and beyond or in Miami for pool play, you have done something extraordinary. And I think that we, Sean, we're so big as a country that I think it's quite a cool thing if we as Americans step back and say, wait a minute, for these players to come to our place, look how excited they are and how how authentically meaningful these experiences are. Maybe we can take a step back and and appreciate a little more about Mm -hmm. how grateful we are to have this sport and have all these great sports. We have every sport that you could dream of and want in our country to play often at the highest level. How awesome is that? Whereas in a great many other places around the world, you have to travel these profound distances to challenge yourself against the best. How lucky are we that for more than a century, our professional sports leagues have been built up to the point where they are, generally speaking, at least in the four majors, regarded as the best in the world. That's pretty cool. And so I, I just think that it that the WBC provides a a unique foundation for us to hopefully reflect a bit on what our national pastime represents. How amazing is it that someone who grows up and as, as far away as Shohei Otani and Julio Rodriguez are both superstars in this game in different ways. That's special. And it's mm-hmm. and it's America's national pastime. Now, our friends in Great Britain would point out correctly that there is ample evidence to suggest that actually baseball was invented in 18th century England. So put a pin in that and revisit that when Great Britain plays the U.S. But but this is our national pastime, popularized largely by Americans and brought around the world in different in different moments. And and then you've seen the cultural traditions of it brought and cultivated and evolves, whether it's in Japan or Korea or Mexico or Cuba or the Dominican Republic. 
it's cool. This is an American sport that connects things and it connects people yeah. like, like that. I just think, Sean, that we can't lose sight of the power in that mm-hmm. and in the interaction that comes. I, I, I tell the story, I've told it before, that, that that one thing that when people ask me, OK, what is what's the meaning of sports? Why? Why do we with all the other things in the world that we have to worry about, which are legitimate and we should worry about out there? Um what still keeps me motivated and and this sort of uh, this sort of this really passionate passionate thing that I have for baseball and why it, why it still matters to me? All I know is that I covered a game in 2016 in Havana where a crowd of 55,000 Cubans heard the American national anthem and cheered after it. Wow, that was a moment. That was a moment where. For all the differences that exist, there was a, a moment of common respect, and and if and if that happened there, if that one moment of of cultural respect occurred, then I I look at this tournament as a vehicle for for common understanding and hope that mm-hmm. when we come together, we realize that we have a lot of things in common, and I just think that there are some pretty profound lessons that we can take and that endure from a coming together like this it's like it's like my favorite summer camp in the world it's just happens to be in the spring and involving baseball and and it, it sort of hopefully we depart from this with a, a little more understanding about each other wow wow that is that is fantastic and i i completely agree on everything that you said and i think that the some of the biggest things that I've learned um, since covering the WBC and international baseball for the first time um, has been through Twitter interactions, just with mm-hmm. people from all around the world. I have never had, I, I grew up in Texas, played baseball all the way through high school, um, kind of just stayed in my own bubble because mm-hmm. growing up in the US, you, you don't really need to go outside of the US to thrive in baseball. So you unless you're seeking it, I mean, I didn't grow up knowing hardly anything about Japanese baseball or Dominican baseball or the Puerto Ricans or the Cubans. So um, once once I started to actually like watch 20, 2017 WBC and learn more about baseball around the world, it really opened my eyes to other cultures and other peoples and people that like things that we can learn here as Americans. And again, another thing that you mentioned, this this tournament really has kind of given me more of an appreciation for the country that we live in and um, the people that have gotten us to where we are at this place, not only in our country, but in the sports and me in my own life. Um, I come from a Mexican American background. So to be able to be here watching the U S and the Mexican team is going to be a blast. So it's, I, I, I think that this WBC is a vehicle to connect people. Like it's been like, it's almost brought me to tears. Honestly, if I'm going to be vulnerable uh, a couple of times in my, on my Twitter account where it's like, I will post something about multiple teams and I'll see like Cuban fans in Cuba talking, using Google Translate with Japanese fans and then Korean fans talking with Canadians and then the Dominicans talking with the kingdom of the Netherlands, uh, their islands and, and people from the Netherlands and Great Britain. It I, There aren't very many ways I feel like that we've been able to connect the world and learn from each other and learn from different cultures. Uh, like I'm seeing through, like I see through international sports. And uh, I think that the WBC is probably a big reason for that. Oh, it's beautifully said, Sean. And I think that for me, you know, I, I follow soccer, not as consistently, certainly as I follow baseball, but I, but I do follow it. And I think it's, it's interesting if you are a fan of U S soccer, when, when American players go to play in Europe, like we get excited. It's it's a sign of respect. It's a sign that we have made it. And the more and more players on our national team that are playing in Europe, we feel a little better about ourselves. We feel more confident. We we feel as though we're getting respect around the world. Well, it's the same thing in the baseball world in terms of when when we as American broadcasters, journalists recognize the talent that is that is developed in in places like Colombia and Mexico as well, where their rosters, I think in both cases, the U.S. will see both teams in pool play. And I think both teams have a chance to beat the U.S. I really do. The, the, Colombia nearly beat the U.S. six years ago, and Colombia's roster is better now 
Yeah. Uh, so, and, and Mexico has beaten the U.S. multiple times in this tournament, and Mexico's roster is better now. So when you look at the, the particulars and, and how much the, the world has grown, it, it, it certainly shows how much talent there is in the world, A, and B, to your point about what we can learn. Because a lot of the, a lot of the, it's amazing. A lot of the the pace and the the, the big time discussion, of course, right now around pace of play and 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 the pitch clock, et cetera. Well, I've always found that when you watch winter ball, when you watch baseball in Latin America, there tends to be a little bit more rhythm to the game, both because of the fans and because of just the style of play on the field. Oh, we yeah. are now legislating our American baseball product. So that way it looks more like the organic product in Latin America. That, that's the truth. That is the truth, Sean. We are we we have realized that to to more properly evolve our game in a way that is more pleasing to the eye, we are making it on a daily basis look more like the game that you see in San Juan, in Santo Domingo, in Caracas, in Barranquilla authentically. That's just the way it's played there. And yeah. so that to me, I think, is further evidence of of our mental exposure to different cultures has quite literally transformed our sport. And and I love uh-huh. too the as a more practical, if you want to view, even view it through the U.S. lens, go back and look at the all tournament teams or the box scores or the star players who who were there for Team Japan in 06 and 09, and how many of them have names that we know now or or 13 in 06 and 09 it was dice k and also darvish in 09 mm-hmm. uh tanaka was on the team in 13 um you think about say suzuki all that he has done and now of course unfortunately won't be able to play because of injury but but there when you watch these tournaments there are players that you will recognize for the first time um and then you will get to know their story a little bit differently and i think too sean i'll, I'll say this as well as a, as a broadcaster I'm someone that always loves asking players their stories and, and, and who has helped them get to a place Uh, the the questions and and storytelling in that way. I'm, I I freely acknowledge, I, I, I borrow from, uh, from Scott Oak, who's the eminent uh, reporter at hockey night in Canada uh, does such a great job of asking players about their stories. And I have found in my career, Sean, that when you speak to people um, and they're wearing the Jersey of their national team, it is a different conversation they are fundamentally in a different headspace when they answer your questions about who you're thinking about how that jersey came to be over your shoulders uh if you're in the case of freddie freeman you know i I mentioned freddie in particular you know he he represents canada because of his parents and most especially because of his late mother rosemary and so freddie in my interactions with him you know you would you would think and certainly you know, everybody uh, who, who has lost a close family member would process grief and, and the pain in a different way and honor them in a different way. And so when it when it comes to Freddie, we've we've talked whether it's on camera or off camera, you know, Freddie welcomes the question about his mom. Mm-hmm. It's a hard topic, understandably, because he was so young when she passed away and it was such a traumatic time in his life. But the WBC and the Canadian jersey is how he makes uh takes that opportunity to share her story again with the world and to have her memory present there on the field as part of his career in life. Like that is a really powerful thing. And he eagerly talks about her. He wants, he wants us to ask him about Rosemary Freeman and her impact on him. And that's where, for me, it's, a, it's a very, that that's a question that you're just not going to ask him on May 20th when he's playing a Dodger Padre game. It's just not, it's not going to come up as naturally, but when he's wearing the uniform, it does. And, and he is eager to share her role in his story. And I think that's one of the many reasons why it's such a powerful life moment for a lot of the people who play in this tournament. Hmm. Wow. Yeah. I, and I've heard Freddie talk about that um, in a couple interviews that he's done about, about his mother and how much it means to him to be able to represent Canada. And when you mentioned that I hadn't thought about this previously, but something that I'm now realizing is how many players in this tournament are getting to represent rep, not, not only represent their parents, but specifically their mother. So you had mm-hmm. Marcus Stroman who's playing for Puerto Rico because his mother's Puerto Rican. And then you have, for example, Tommy Edmond, his mother's from Korea. 
Lars Newbar, his mother's from Japan. You don't see a lot of those names that you would assume Newt Bar doesn't sound Japanese, but mm -hmm. they have that tie to their family and that culture because of their mother's side. Something I hadn't really thought about, but that's pretty cool that a lot of these players get to represent a side of their family that people don't really know until they, they get right. to on the stage. That's beautifully said, Sean. And, and I think that, you know, one thing I'm lucky that I've been able to do, especially in the last 10 years or so is, is explore more in, in a more detailed way, my own roots and and travel to Italy, visit the town where my mom's family came from originally. And so I hope, I just think about what a blessing that's been in my life that I've been able to bring my family there and, and experience that, um, that, that when players are representing their, their mom's side of the family or um, delving deeper into their own family story, that at some point in a, in a year's time or, or two years time that you've got, Sal Freilich playing for Team Italy, that he's going back to Italy to maybe work on a, a baseball camp or clinic, um, and that and that there's a there's a paying it forward that occurs there, and that when Sal is in Italy, that there's a understanding of what that means, and 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 that he's participating in something that's quite literally larger than any one of us, and I, and I just think that that, and I hope in the future that we see the Cardinals playing a series in Seoul in three or four years time and Tommy's on the field and that uh, there's a time when maybe Lars Newbar is playing a game for the Cardinals uh, in, in the Tokyo dome uh, that there, that this is not just a, a one moment, but it's a, it's the start or continuation of something more profound. And, and I'll say this too, Sean, that one of my favorite moments from, from covering the premier 12 in Japan mm -hmm. um, uh, is the way that the custom occurs in Japan and the Japanese crowds every time, Efren Navarro, who you may know, certainly played for Mexico in different tournaments and was playing for Mexico in that Premier 12. Every time Efren came to bat, he received a, a very uh, heartfelt ovation from the fans of Japan because he was playing in Japan at the time. Mm. So he was, even though he wasn't playing for the Tokyo Giants, there was a respect and a, an awareness. How about that? On the part of the fans that that Efren had, had done the work to come over to Japan, play baseball in Japan, embrace the Japanese culture. And even when he was facing a team Japan pitcher or, or facing a, another team, and there was consequences in that game for team Japan, that Efren deserved that respect that because he had come to this country and, and given of his career and his time to learn that it became part of his own story and part of their story. And so they applauded for him every time. Like that to me is like a goosebumps moment for me to just see the respect they had for Efren because of what a great person he is. Yeah. And, and he's still playing now. He's playing in Tijuana now back, back in Mexico. He's grown up mostly in the U S but you know, Efren's just a great example of someone who has taken that opportunity to travel the world and, and really done a whole profound amount of great things with it. That is, that reminds me, of something that just happened like a week ago. Um, a little bit of a different situation since Cuban baseball and coming out of C Cuba is, is very different than a mm. lot of other countries playing baseball. Um, but I'm, I'm sure you saw it when Cuba was playing in one of their exhibition games in Japan uh, against one of the NPB teams, I believe. Um, both Despagne and Gracial have played multiple years in Japan and have been very big figures in Japanese baseball to where all of the Japanese fans there Every time that they'd come up to bat before the game and after the game, they would give a standing ovation. And it was just, it was so cool to see. They had signs that said like, gracias, gracial. Um, mm -hmm. And just to see the respect and the connection between these two baseball cultures is, I don't know, something that I would love to see moving forward. I could talk about this for five hours. Um, I did want to ask you really quick because it kind of ties into that. Something that we talked about, we touched on briefly was the soccer world the international mm -hmm. football world, that landscape is completely interconnected. Mm -hmm. You got fans in England or Germany or Brazil, they're all watching each other's leagues. Mm -hmm. That's not something that baseball has really ever had in the past to that extent. Um, do you think that that interconnected baseball world is something that is possible in the future? Great question. I, I think that it's it it can become more connected, certainly. And and one thing that I would love to see, Sean, I think the 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 principal way to do it, and obviously it's 
it's hard because of the volume of games. I think that's the one big thing that baseball has in comparison to other sports is that if, you, if you've got 162 and your team is is the Brewers or your team is the Cardinals, you're you're allocating so much of your time already to your team to then religiously watch a team in the middle of the night as great as the leagues are in Japan and Korea. Like that's just from a human standpoint, that's asking a lot of one's sleep schedule. So, so it just by the number of, of hours. So I, I think that it's great that we could follow it. I think it's, it's a lot to ask to do it on a consistent basis, which is why my goal, uh, my dream is that on a more consistent basis that you would see a, a showdown series type of a moment between the national teams of the U.S. and Japan or the Dominican Republic and Japan. I know that teams are always wary about how many innings pitchers are throwing, and I get that. But if you would imagine a every couple years even, uh, I realize they've done postseason series before between uh, MLB All-Star teams and the NPB All-Stars. But what if every couple years you did it where it was Team USA, best of seven. You started at Dodger Stadium for three, and then go to the Tokyo Dome, and and it's it's those two jerseys on the field. I think now that we've gotten Sean to the point that a larger percentage of the very best players are playing now yep. for Team USA. One thing that Jerry Colangelo, I remember after the thirteen WBC, I spoke with him about his experience in basketball and what he did to help revive the USA basketball program after the 04 uh, Olympics did not go the U.S.'s way. He said what was important was getting buy-in from from LeBron and Kobe and the big stars, but also playing more consistently and saying that if you want to be part of the Olympic roster, and maybe maybe we'll see a moment where, where that happens in L.A. 2028, but if you want to be part of the Olympic roster, you have to play these intermediate tournaments to keep yourself in consideration. And that's where if you have a chance to have a showdown series for seven games and, and what the ratings would be like around the country, play it in November, whenever it might be between the U S and Japan or the Dominican in Japan or the Dominican in the U S, whatever it might be. But I, I think that is something Sean, that I would love to see happen that I think would help continue to build the enthusiasm for international baseball in the years between the WBCs. Yeah, I have been talking about that ad nauseum, I feel like for the last year is that if we can get a way to for it to just be more normalized to see these national teams playing against each other. However, that looks like obviously there are a bunch of barriers that are put in place to get to that point. But if we can find a way to get these teams on the field consistently, even if it's just every year or every two years, more consistently than every four years, I think that it would just speed up the process of getting to where we want the WBC to be. Because I think that um, the, just the fact that this tournament is so new, the WBC, and that's like the first taste for a lot of American fans at international baseball. If we can get it to be more consistent and and just be able to see these players on the field against each other more, I, I think that fans will start to jump on board um, and, and be able to like really buy into the WBC quicker. Fully agree. And it might, my hope is that we see it more and more often. I know that he's looking at this year. I'm excited as well. And obviously my, my full focus is on the WBC at the moment, but certainly to have the, the Mexico series coming up at the end of April, goodness, that's next month. So uh, which is amazing to say, uh, and then you've got the London series as well. So it's a really aggressive play plan for MLB. And I hope that, the more success you have, the more marketing and sponsorship that goes around it. And hopefully we get a ton of momentum after this tournament that that makes even more playing possible in the future. Yeah, I, I completely agree. And I hope that that's, that happens. I'm so sad we are running short on time. Um, I did... I could talk about this, like I said, with you for hours and hours um, real quick before we jump off, just super quick. This WBC we've talked about is different from past WBCs. What do you think is the biggest reason for that? Uh, great question. Certainly more, more teams. Uh, I think that the overall, I would say this, that the overall potential of up and coming teams like Mexico, like Colombia, I think Venezuela is the best I've seen them since 09 at the very least. Uh, and maybe even longer than that might be their best team ever. So I think we're seeing more teams that are that are legitimate threats to reach the semifinals. Now, it, it always comes down to pitching. But I think in a one-off scenario, Sean, I, I would there's almost no outcome in this tournament 
that would truly stun me because of how closely matched the teams are. And if you've got a team like Canada, Mexico, Colombia, they've all got uh, an, an ace or two to throw at the other team in a, in a huge spot. So I just think that this will be the tournament of the upsets. I very well said. That was beautifully said, John. Thank you so much for coming on. Um, this has been an absolute blast and a pleasure for me. Um, I think that people are going to definitely take value away from this, uh, just learning about international baseball. You are welcome on at any time, anytime you'd like to just spew anything about international baseball. <laughs> I am happy to talk. <laughs> Very good, Sean. I, I appreciate all you do. Thanks for just doing such a great job of covering this amazing tournament and uh, look forward to staying in touch here during the future. I agree. For those that are watching the WBC, he will be covering it in person in Miami for the final and the semifinal, as well as the quarterfinals, I believe. So uh, thank you, John Morosi. This has been a blast. Thanks, John. All the best. See ya. Take care. Thanks so much.